Prince T'Challa, son of King T'Chaka. Rest in peace to the greatest king Wakanda had ever seen, and a heavy spoiler alert for Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. With the release of the Black Panther sequel, we have finally been able to see what Ryan Coogler and the MCU did to handle the passing of the late great Chadwick Boseman. A country, and honestly a cinematic universe in mourning, Wakanda Forever is a testament to the master storytellers behind the most advanced nation in the MCU. Characters got new arcs, and new villains were introduced, but we can't help but wonder, just what if T'Challa and the MCU were still around? Let's dive in deep enough to reach Talokan right now. I have a plan. Really? What is it? In 2020, the world saw the much too early passing of the fantastic actor Chadwick Boseman. Chadwick brought to life King T'Challa, starting in the MCU with Captain America Civil War, and eventually in his own solo film in 2018. He then appeared multiple other times, including both Avengers films Infinity War and Endgame. T'Challa was set to have a bright future in the MCU, but when the man who brought him to life unfortunately passed away, the leadership behind the greatest cinematic universe of all time made the difficult decision not to recast the role. With this decision, the Black Panther sequel, which was already heavily anticipated, definitely changed direction. Trust me when I tell you this is where the spoilers get hot and heavy, so final warning. Black Panther Wakanda Forever opens with Shuri being unable to cure her brother of some undisclosed illness, leading to the death and funeral of King T'Challa. Because of this, characters like Ramonda and Shuri took on the responsibility of running the country of Wakanda. However, this isn't the first time control of Wakanda fell on the shoulders of someone besides the reigning king. Going way back, we have to look at just where the universe left off with T'Challa before things got real dicey. The end of Black Panther saw T'Challa defeating his cousin Eric Killmonger and effectively saving the world from all-out war. However, he did take lessons from the philosophical fight against the revenge-filled villain. After this victory in battle, T'Challa decided to open up Wakanda to the world, who previously thought the country to be a third world nation with little to no resources, and not the world power it grew to be over an untold number of years of advancing in secret thanks to the help of a mound of vibranium the civilization was built on. We were just getting ready to see what the world was going to be like with a nation like Wakanda playing a larger global role. Then of course, a wrinkly chinned purple dude just so happened to have decided to go on a quest to wipe out half of life in the universe which culminated in a battle on Wakandan soil, leading to Thanos collecting all six Infinity Stones and completing his mission. During Thanos' original snap, one of the loudest gasps from the audience came from the moment that King T'Challa the Black Panther faded into dust while trying to help up his General Okoye. After the remaining surviving Avengers found Thanos in space and ended his life, they learned it was too late and that the Infinity Stones, the only things capable of bringing everyone back, were seemingly gone forever. A long five years passed with all those who have been snapped out of existence just up and gone with no hope to return. That was of course until the same Avengers regrouped and casually invented time travel so that they could go retrieve past versions of the stones and use them to snap everyone who had been gone back into existence. The crowd possibly cheered the loudest when King T'Challa walked through a portal to the wreckage of the Avengers compound, with his sister Shuri and General Okoye by his side. This battle unfortunately ended with mainstay MCU characters, who had at this point been at the forefront of stories and the leaders of the universe coming to their end. Iron Man sacrificed himself to save the world, and Captain America went back in time to be with a woman he truly loved. This left a hole in the universe, only to be filled by new characters, and possibly chief among those characters who should take this leading role were none other than King T'Challa. This is where Ryan Coogler's plans for the Black Panther sequel would have kicked off. Truthfully, Coogler said the movie would have been very similar to the movie we actually got. Instead of mourning the death of King T'Challa, the Wakandans along with their king would be mourning all the time that had been lost in those five years of what would come to be known as the Blip. The sequel was always going to have Namor, and the idea of King T'Challa vs Namor the Submariner is something I've wanted to see on the big screen for a long time. But given the circumstances, what we got was pretty great. Instead, we got Queen Ramonda running the Kingdom of Wakanda, with quite a regal presence. But the goings on around the world almost seemed to prove to us why Wakanda stayed in isolation for so long. Immediately, countries began trying to steal the resources of Wakanda, and without their king these countries believed Wakanda to be at a disadvantage. Boy were they wrong. After the death of Queen Ramonda at the hands of Namor, the responsibility fell to Shuri, who had to grow up much faster than she had planned to become the symbol of hope in Wakanda and bring the Black Panther back to life. The sequel also included Riri Williams, 
A genius 19-year-old whose life became endangered when she invented a device to detect vibranium, which turned out to be the same material that helped Namor and his kingdom of Talokan rise to the same status as Wakanda. Or should I say sink to it? We know from Coogler that had T'Challa been a part of the sequel, the grief that the country faced would not have been for the loss of their king, but instead the setbacks, placed just after Wakanda was open to the world, and then immediately left defenseless without its king, its scientific genius, and several of its warriors. T'Challa would have dealt with a great deal of guilt over his forced five-year absence, and in that moment of grief he would have had to face off against the ruler of an equally advanced kingdom who wanted to bring the world to its knees. I don't believe the rest of the world would have been depicted in such an evil way had T'Challa survived. Ramonda had no reason to trust anyone. It makes sense, she's lost her husband and her son to unfair circumstances. And in her grief, the rest of the world tried to take advantage of her nation. I think if T'Challa were still alive, he may have had a few more allies in the world, proving his decision to open up a worthwhile risk. I still think Shuri would have grown into a warrior at the loss of both her parents, and I'm sure Namor still would have taken the life of Queen Ramonda. So, the Black Panther sequel that we got was actually not all that far off from what would have happened if T'Challa was still there. But the remainder of the MCU will tell what exactly T'Challa's absence means for the story that could have happened. Though, and again I cannot stress enough the amount of spoiler alert I am throwing at you, there may be another T'Challa who becomes old enough to fill those roles very soon. But for now, let's take a look at what we may be missing out on in the very near future. Great. Give it to me. Forward in time. To view alternate futures. To see all the possible outcomes of the coming conflict. The mid credit scene of Black Panther Wakanda Forever reveals to us that before his untimely death, King T'Challa had a son with Nakia. That son's name, of course, was also T'Challa, named after the great king of Wakanda. So many of the stories I'm about to pitch could theoretically happen in the future, but we will have to wait for that young T'Challa to grow up and take his father's place. Had T'Challa been in Black Panther Wakanda Forever, we would have seen a similar ending, a tumultuous relationship with an underwater superpower, and in a more vulnerable state for the rest of the world to come knocking. T'Challa would be on the throne, and Shuri would have grown to a degree where she would have taken on more leadership within Wakanda. From that point, there are several places we could have gone. Let's start with my favorite, shall we? Though Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness may have ruined these chances for the sake of a joke in killing off some of Marvel's strongest characters, I believe we could have been headed towards the formation of an Illuminati in the main Earth-616 timeline. In the comics, this Illuminati has seen a few members come in and out, but both Black Panther and Namor have been part of this secret underground group. T'Challa is noble, and once the plans of the Illuminati turned a little too borderline evil for his taste, I could have seen him being the first to leave. But prior to that, both he and Namor could have served on this Council of Six very powerful Marvel characters who secretly basically run the world. With the MCU the way it is, the Illuminati could also have consisted of members like Doctor Strange, Captain Marvel, Thor, Sam Wilson, or even introduced traditional members from the comics like Charles Xavier or Black Bolt, who were seen in the Multiverse of Madness. The most notable thing this group ever did was launch the Hulk into space, causing him to become a gladiator on a far-off planet, and eventually return to Earth scorned and looking for revenge. This was known as the World War Hulk storyline. It's unlikely we will see this now, especially without T'Challa, and with the Hulk randomly showing up with the sun at the end of She-Hulk. But the storyline could have set up an incredible phase-ending movie for the MCU. Another storyline I thought would have been cool to see was instead of World War Hulk, how about just World War? We have set up several civilizations in the Marvel Universe, and Black Panther Wakanda Forever just added another one in the form of Talo Khan. Imagine the great powers of the world, having to go up against a new superpower rising in the form of Latveria. That's right, we could have introduced Victor Von Doom leading his technologically advanced nation in a war against the rest of the world. Think of civilizations joining this battle, like New Asgard. They could team with the American Avengers, and join Wakanda, who believe Namor is on their side, only for him to switch and join with Doctor Doom. And now we have All Out War with T'Challa and Valkyrie on one side and Doom and Namor on the other. Theoretically, this could still happen, but with the loss of King T'Challa, the MCU has had to focus greatly on the inner workings of Wakanda as opposed to their relationship with the rest of the world. Much of the Black Panther sequel had to focus on what the country does to replace their great king, as opposed to what their king does for the nation in relation to the rest of the world. Lastly, we have to mention the part King T'Challa should have played in the upcoming plans for the MCU. When the first Black Panther came out, we already knew that Thanos was coming. So, the Black Panther's future plans had to be put on hold for the sake of saving the universe. Now, at the conclusion of Wakanda Forever, we would have found ourselves with T'Challa in a similar place. Sure, the Illuminati could have formed, or the most powerful nations in the world could have gone to war. 
But there's still the pesky Kang the Conqueror problem. The Kang Dynasty and eventually Secret Wars after that would have come out, and King T'Challa would have played a large role as one of these new leaders at the forefront of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He could have been a key component in introducing the Fantastic Four, just like the First Family was in introducing him in the comics. And he could have helped the rest of the heroes fight and defeat Kang, only to be caught up in the midst of an incursion that leads to Secret Wars. In the comics, T'Challa and Namor actually play a huge role in ultimately taking down Doctor Doom, or at least to enough of a degree that brings the story to an end. Truthfully, Namor and T'Challa have one of the most interesting comic book relationships that may be taken over by Shuri now, but it won't be the same considering Shuri is not the one who ends up on the throne. Part of the interest in the relationship between Namor and T'Challa is that they're both rulers of their respective nations, so they have to have some degree of respect for each other even if they don't always get along. There is some of that in Namor and Shuri's relationship in the MCU, but I think we will be missing out on the possible adventures of Namor and T'Challa that would have gone so well together. Again, that all may still happen, but we would have to see major time jumps in the MCU to see the younger T'Challa grow up to be king, forcing us to miss out on a lot of time in the lives of other characters in the universe. You're so big. <laughs> what will you do? I'm not sure. For the first time in a thousand years, I... I have no path. Black Panther Wakanda Forever has now been released, and as much fun as it is to speculate what could have been, let's take a look at where we go from here. As stated, every story that we've talked about today could theoretically happen, with T'Challa, the king's son, introduced in the mid credit scene, once he becomes an adult. However, I don't think we'll see an immediate jump in time, which means the characters in Wakanda all likely have a future in the MCU, or at least the ones that made it out of Wakanda Forever. Riri Williams, for example, is being sent back to Boston after helping the Wakandans defeat Namor. She also has her very own Disney Plus series set up, and a taste of what her technology can do to help her become a superhero. I think it's safe to say the lessons she learned in Wakanda Forever have changed her and will help her lead her very own show. Then of course there's Wakanda. Personally, I never believed Shuri was ready for the throne. As your technological advancements have been overseen by a child who scoffs at tradition. She had no experience ruling, and we've not seen her take any kind of lessons from either of her parents or her brother in regards to ruling a nation. So it's fitting that she would carry on with the Black Panther mantle, and not the role of ruler of Wakanda. Instead, that role went to someone who's been waiting for it for a long time. And it's someone who turned out to be Shuri's friend and unlikely mentor, M'Baku. M'Baku is the only one who showed up on challenge day for the vacant throne of Wakanda, likely at the request or at least the permission of Shuri who did not show up at all. Any of the conflicts I mentioned that could have been issues T'Challa would have to face now fall on the shoulders of M'Baku, likely with the support of people like Shuri and Okoye. If the world does decide to get itself in a world war with the most powerful nations like New Asgard, Talokan, and the introduction of Latveria, it will have to be M'Baku who leads the forces of Wakanda in this venture. And listen, I'm a big M'Baku fan, but I think he may prove to be less than capable. He just doesn't carry the type of authority that someone like T'Challa or Ramunda had. So while Shuri showed that Wakanda is definitely still not to be messed with, taking up the mantle as the Black Panther, they could find themselves in a weaker position than they've ever been in before, without a member of the royal family, descendants of the first Black Panther Bashenga, sitting on the throne. Okoye would die for her country, and will likely serve at M'Baku's side as one of his head generals and likely still lead the Dora Milaje against any conflict the country finds itself in. But what about Shuri? When T'Challa was still alive, it was said to be Shuri's responsibility to oversee the outreach centers that were being set up across the world. We have yet to actually see her take up that role, which is why I think the Black Panther will now be more of a global hero than just the protector of Wakanda. Obviously, her home nation will always come first, but I think we will see Shuri as the Black Panther teaming up in a lot more projects belonging to other heroes. She could make a trip to Boston to help her old friend Riri Williams, or even show up in something like Fantastic Four in order to match brain power with someone like Reed Richards. I think wherever Shuri goes next, she could be preparing to take up the throne for now, but will use her newfound powers to protect those just like her brother would have. Finally, we have Nakia, whose role should be pretty apparent at this point. Nakia will likely stay in Haiti to raise her son T'Challa, to be the future ruler of Wakanda. I would not be surprised if we didn't see her again beyond a cameo or two while she raises the next heir. The MCU may have found a way to respectfully put to rest the character of T'Challa, but still found a way to ensure that we will have a T'Challa in the universe in the future. All of these stories and all of these what-ifs could eventually play out when King T'Challa's son, Prince T'Challa, grows up to fill his dad's shoes. Whatever the case and whatever these characters do going forward, they will always have T'Challa in their hearts, much like the very audience watching it all unfold.
It's safe to say that there's a universe out there somewhere in the vast multiverse where all of these what-if scenarios came to fruition. But given the circumstances, I think we're in for an exciting ride nonetheless. What do you think would be the biggest difference if T'Challa were still around in the MCU? 